let go of the past and the future. In Buddhism attachment is where we identify with these states, where we make a self out of them and become them. This is how they find a foothold inside of us. We can see all these things like physical tiredness, it's just the body, that's all. That's why the forest masters told us to just reflect upon the body. Tiredness is part of having a body. The older we get the more tired we get. It is just a natural process. The energy that we have when we're young is going to go. We are never going to have that oomph when we get into our 50s and we're only going to drag ourselves around when we are in our 70s. That's just the nature of this body. We have to get used to it. We can't fight it or control it. What we can do is realize that it's just the body being tired. Sometimes when I go back to my hut at night my body is so tired. I've been running around all day doing things for people, and then I remember that teaching of the Buddha, I have great faith in the Buddha's teaching stash even though the body is sick, the mind doesn't need to be sick. Even though the body is tired, the mind doesn't need to be tired. These are very powerful teachings. Teachings like these are great, because we are often tired physically but not mentally. That is how we can cheer ourselves up. Separate the mind from the body and even though the body is hurting, we just let it go, and follow the Buddha's teachings on meditation. Let go of the past and the future, and we're just left with the present moment. Let go of the in our conversation. That in our conversation is the worst thing we're attached to. We think ourselves into so much suffering. It would be a wonderful thing if we could just shut up inside and stop all of that proliferation of thoughts and ideas. The problem is we trust our thinking. We think it's so valuable. Because we trust the views that are built up from our thoughts, we get into so much difficulty and strife. If you want to believe in something believe in silence. If you want to be attached to anything, be attached to that silence in the mind. Seek that out and make it a friend. All lies are in words, all truth is in silence. So we can see that if we listen to words they're basically lies, it's not quite truth, it's not quite reality, it's not quite accuracy, it is one stage removed from truth. We believe all those lies again and again and again. How much suffering has that caused us? We don't gain insight through thinking, we just gain headaches. We just gain suffering. We just gain arguments. We just gain confusion and depression. That's all we gain. Though thinking. Follow the Buddha's advice and be quiet, be calm. The Buddhist word for a wise person is an Arat, a Santa Muni, a silent sage. There is wisdom in that silence. That's where we can start hearing the world, seeing the world, feeling the world. Knowing what's going on. So you are wise if you are pushing wheelbarrows with a silent mind. Then it's easy. That reminds me of when I was a student. I don't know how I got involved because I was never very athletic, but going to a place like Cambridge they roped me into the boat club. So for at least one year I was rowing in a boat along the river. It was a crazy way to spend an afternoon because it was really hard work. I thought, it's just rowing on a nice afternoon in the sunshine. It doesn't matter how fast we go as long as we enjoy ourselves. That was not what the coach thought. The coach wanted us to go fast and beat the other teams. I remember once. During a race rowing as hard as I could and feeling a lot of physical pain. The coach shouted at me, you're scowling, smile and it won't hurt so much. It was true. I followed his advice and even though I was in pain, I put a smile on my face and half. The pain disappeared. I was able row on quite fast. It's the same with whatever we're doing in life. We can put happiness into it or we can put pain into it. 
From our external experiences thoughts arise and proliferate and we can create this whole mass of suffering over what we are doing, or we can just shut up. As we shut up we become more peaceful. We realize this is just a physical body, sometimes it hurts, sometimes it's a pleasure, sometimes it's comfortable, sometimes it's a discomfort. We can't control it at all. Wherever we go in the world, however wealthy or powerful we are, it's always the same. Now it's pleasurable, now it's painful. Now it's comfortable, now it's uncomfortable. Now we hear something nice that we like to hear, now we hear something that we don't like to hear. Now we see beauty. Now you see ugliness. Now we taste something that is delicious, now we taste something that is awful. That's life, sensory experience. If we start thinking about that and try to find ways and means to get what we like, only the nice and pleasurable, only the delicious food, only the monastery we like, we find we can't do that. It's impossible. We'd be running around the whole world forever. A John Che used to say that we're searching for the tortoise with the mustache. Tortoises don't have mustaches. That's why pleasure in the physical world won't be found. I'm talking about permanent pleasure, permanent satisfaction. We only have moments of happiness. If something is causing you suffering, it must be wrong attitude or wrong understanding. You're looking at things in the incorrect way. You're not letting go. The whole purpose of this practice is to let go of the world of the body and the five senses. That means not just your physical body, but all physical bodies, the monastery, the country, and the whole world. Letting go of that means being able to close your eyes and just be silent. Not allowing the experiences of the day to echo in your meditation. The ability to let go of the past is such a fundamental aspect of this meditation. Do you understand how you carry the past into the present moment when you try to meditate? How difficult that makes the meditation. There is no good reason to carry the past into the present. We don't have to do that, it's attachment. That's all. It's stupidity. The past is gone, finished, done with. We can't change it. Very often we look at the past with biased opinions. We seek out what happened in the past according to the emotions that are present in the mind now. If we're feeling happy, great, we look at all the good things that happened today. If we're in a bad mood we look at all the bad things that happened today. The best way is not to look at all. Who can trust memory? In meditation, it doesn't matter what we've just been doing. If someone's argued with us or called us stupid, or someone on the phone has been talking foolish and nonsense for a long time, just let that go. The next moment it's gone. The only way to meditate is by letting go and freeing yourself from the past. Do that at least while you're staying at this monastery. Get that degree of insight and that degree of ability to cut off the past, even what happened a moment ago. Sometimes when I begin to meditate I haven't got my wisdom faculty turned on, so the first part of the meditation is hopeless. I'm thinking about the monastery or worrying about this or that. But I always remember that at any moment in the meditation I can turn it around and turn a hopeless meditation into a brilliant meditation by just letting go of the past. When I first began to meditate, if I started with a rotten meditation I'd worry about it, and it would carry on right through the whole hour. I would carry the mistakes of the past into the present all the time. Thinking, this is a rotten meditation, or I can't meditate. Why isn't it working? Well? But the point was not why isn't it working well, I came to realize that I was just lingering on attachments to the past. This is why we have to learn how to let go of the past if we want to be free, if we want to be at peace, if we want to develop meditation.
especially deep states of meditation. Give it everything you've got. I trained myself and I want you to train yourselves, so that at any moment you can just turn to the present moment to be completely free, even if you have great pain, unsatisfactoriness, or difficulties. If you can be just there in the present moment then you find that you are completely free of everything that has happened. You don't even recall it, you've cut the mind off from what's happened in the past. It doesn't matter if you've been wheelbarrowing earth for six or seven days for a reason you just cannot understand. It doesn't matter what you have been doing. The wheelbarrow that you are wheeling now is all that's important. Don't go about saying, Why am I doing this? This isn't what I became a monk for. You realize that is just causing you suffering. Let go of all of the past and stay in the present moment. I let go of all the business that I see on my desk as I close my eyes before meditating. I don't even worry about it. I'm only a part time abbot. It's true. When I do my work, I'm an abbot. When I close my eyes, I'm not an abbot, I'm a meditator in this present moment. That's the way I survive and that's the way you have to survive. You've all got projects and things you have to do, difficulties, responsibilities and pain in the body, but follow this advice and let go of the past and the future. Dwell in the present moment because that is the only place you can get some quietness. It doesn't matter about all the mistakes you've made, all the errors you've made. They are only problems and difficulties if you keep hanging on to them. Let them go. Some people say you can't do that unless you believe you can do it. But you can do it. Even Asculamilla, MN86, with all his bad karma became enlightened in a very short time. The only people who can't let go are people who have killed their mother or father in this life. When you realize you can just let go in this way, you understand how to meditate. You let go of your attachments to the past, you let go of your attachment to this body. If you can do this, then you know you are getting somewhere on this path. You can do this. If you can't do this yet, then you have more training to do. You don't have to go somewhere else to do it. Everywhere else is basically the same as here. You have to do this now, here in this moment. There comes a time when you just stand your ground and say, Mara, I'm not going to follow your tricks anymore. This is where I'm going to stand and do battle. Just do as the Buddha said, let go of the past and the future, let go of the thinking mind, be silent and watch the breath. Just be with every breath. Why can't I do that all the time? We make things so hard and complex and complicated. It's easy to watch the breath if you can let go of the past and the future. Let go of the thinking mind. Let go of controlling. Don't do it your way, do it in the Buddha's way. Just watch the breath. We can watch the breath in this moment. That's all we need to do. It's just a case of having the right attitude of detachment. It's easy then to watch the breath. The success of years of meditation is a sign of how much you have detached from the world. If you can't meditate it's because there is some craving, some attachment. There. Put enjoyment into the breath in the same way as you put enjoyment into sweeping up leaves. As a John choose to say, give it everything you've got no matter what you're doing. Brushing your teeth give it everything you've got, make it a very good job. Pushing the wheelbarrow, make it a beautiful job. Do the best you can. Give it full attention every moment, that's how you watch the breath. Give yourself completely to the breath. Complete surrender to the breath. It doesn't matter what your body is doing, how early or how late it is, how hot or how cold it is. Just be with the breath for a few moments. If you can do this and follow the instructions, you will find it is the easiest thing in the world to watch the breath. It's easy if you are detached, 
if you can let go. So find that way of letting go, train yourself to let go. When you're watching the breath it's the last part of the body that you're still attached. 2. And if you continue just watching the breath, being with the breath, the mind becomes so bright, so beautiful and it becomes apparent that it's a natural process. In the footsteps of the Buddha. Enjoy the meditation and the meditation becomes fun. That's because you are beginning to let go of the world. The longer you can let go of the world the more that enjoyment and pleasure increases. Meditate for five minutes, it feels good. I'm talking about real meditation, watching the breath, not messing around and thinking. If you can watch the breath for five minutes at ease in the moment, just being with the breath, not controlling, it becomes peaceful, and if you can continue that for an hour it becomes very delightful. The longer you maintain the attention on the breath, the more the mind grows in happiness, grows in energy, grows in contentment. It's the build up of samadhi that's all. As you build up that samadhi on the breath, bliss takes over. If you're patient enough, don't interfere and don't try and control it, it becomes the beautiful breath. The beautiful breath is just the nature of the breath at this particular stage. If you can get to this stage it means you've detached from so much. You've detached from the world long enough, let go of the world long enough, for the mind to start to brighten up the consciousness. What happens next is that, from that brightness, as it grows more and more and more into the beautiful breath, the breath disappears. You're just left with the beautiful and the beautiful turns into a beautiful nimitta, which is the reflection of the mind. That shows that you've let go of even more. It's a sign of detachment from the world, a sign of letting go, a sign that wisdom is starting to manifest. If you can go into that nimitta you can also go into a jhana. You are re-experiencing the footsteps of the Buddha. These are the signs of letting go. It's called Nekhamasukha, because it is the happiness born of renunciation. Renunciation is just another word for letting go. If you can't go into a Namita or a Jana that means that you still have a lot more letting go to do. It means there are still attachments and illusions there. You still haven't seen what needs to be done or how to do it. So be humble, don't be proud. And don't follow your own ideas. If you can't get into these deep states it means there is something you haven't seen yet. See if you can do some more letting go, some more renunciation. Have trust in the practice of the forest teachers, these are the people who do become enlightened, who do get samadhi, who do get jhanas. This is the path for overcoming the attachments. Only after you have entered into those Janas and emerged have you got the basic data, the experience of pure mind and the experience of seeing things cease. Only then have you got the opportunity and chance to really see the three characteristics. You have to achieve those Janas for yourself. Without these experiences you haven't yet learned enough to see Anukha, Dukkha and Anitta. That is why you need to have these experiences sooner or later. Only when You've let go that much, can you really understand what letting go is? If you haven't been able to get into jhanas yet it means you still have attachments. You haven't seen, let alone untied the attachments. There are still cravings, and there are still illusions. Illusions are overcome by seeing how everything works through a widening perspective, through seeing things from a different standpoint. That's the whole point of the jhanas, they give you a different perspective, a different standpoint. A place from which to look upon the world with such obvious clarity and see Anukha, Dukkha and Anutta. You can't see them without that experience. People look in the suttas to try and find ways of getting around this but they always end with the last factor of the Eightfold Path, which is the four jhanas. That's not just said once in the Suttas, it's said many, many times. 
you just have to do this. So don't be proud, don't be stubborn, just give yourself up to the teaching of the Buddha, to the Eightfold Path. Don't think too much. Don't try and work it all out. Intellectually. Just unbind, let go, of yourself, and get some silence in the mind. Don't waste the opportunities you have. It doesn't matter what you have been doing. In the morning, afternoon or evening, when you're meditating don't let the past hinder your progress. That's the only way to release yourself. Once you can do these things, you will see the Dhamma for yourself. It's not just theory, it's also experiences. You know what attachment is because you can detach yourself. You can experience it as a process, not just as an idea. You know what letting go is because you've experienced it. You know what freedom is because you've experienced that freedom. You know what the Buddha's mind is like, because you have experienced the same thing. You know how this whole process works. You've let go of so much that there is only a tiny bit more to let go of. If you can't let go of that last bit, at least you've let go of so much that you should at least be an anagami. We need more of those kinds of monks in the world. We don't need more monks building monasteries. We don't need more monks writing books or translating books. We need more monks who can give talks from their own experiences. We need more monks who are Ariyas. We need more monks who are stream winners, more monks who are errants, more monks who have experienced jhanas. We need more monks who can walk in the footsteps of the great monks of old, who can say that they've experienced what venerable Sariputta, what venerable Malana, what venerable Kasapa, what venerable Ananda, and what venerable Anuruddha experienced. This Buddhism is not just an historical point of interest, it is alive with the re-experiencing of all the facets of the Dhamma. So let go of your attachments, have confidence and faith. It can be done. There was a novice who saw a man training an elephant and he thought, if a man can train a wild elephant, surely I can train my mind. You're much smaller than an elephant and you're not as stubborn as a wild elephant. So if a man can train a wild elephant to do whatever he wants, surely you can train your own mind? To train your mind don't give in to it, don't follow its moods and don't follow its stupidity. Just train the mind. Don't go with the stream of your ideas, and thoughts, and delusions. Go against that stream. Be rebellious against your instincts and cravings. If someone says, you can't do this, I say, why? When I was a kid if someone put a sign on a park bench saying don't touch, I would touch it out of spite. It didn't matter if I got paint on my hand or I got into trouble. Using that rebelliousness in the Dhamma, if I'm too tired to meditate, I check it out anyway. One of my most interesting meditations was when I had typhus fever. You're not supposed to be able get into deep meditation when you have typhus fever because you have no energy at all. This was in the hospital in Yabon, Thailand, 24 years ago. The first day I was there, at 6 o'clock in the afternoon the nurse disappeared. I asked the monk next to me, when is the night nurse coming on? Dash night nurse. He said, there is no night nurse. If you die at night that's bad luck, there is only a nurse during the daytime. I don't know if you could really call them nurses, they were really tough and not at all sensitive. I remember having to go to the toilet. There were no bedpans, I had to lurch from one bed to the next one and then hold on until I got enough energy to lurch to the next bed. I had to hold on because I had no strength at all, and my head was dizzy. When I finally got to the toilet I stayed there as long as possible to make sure that everything was out, because I didn't want to go through that experience again for a few hours. I 
was very weak and no one was helping me. I remember feeling so rotten and terrible. So weak and so sick and so depressed, after being in hospital for a couple of weeks. With typhus fever. There was no care of any sort. And then I got so rebellious. I thought, so what? I'm going to watch my breath. Now you're not supposed to be able to do that. It's supposed to be impossible when you're so sick. But I just watched my breath and got into a nice deep meditation. It was wonderful, it was the best part of being in hospital, the best part of the typhus fever. Being able to meditate and get into deep meditation, just getting blissed out in that way was great. That experience taught me how much the body lies. The body said, you can't meditate now, but I called its bluff. Sometimes I could even meditate when in great pain. You can do it if you believe you can. It's always been a part of my practice to be completely rebellious. When someone tells me I can't, I ask, why not? Hopefully this will be an encouragement to each one of you. If it's late, it doesn't matter. If you feel tired and so sleepy, it doesn't matter. If you're really sick, it doesn't matter. Just go against the stream, go against the accepted ideas, and liberate yourself from all that's happened in the past. The last moment I was tired, but what about this moment? This is how you can practice, how you can let go of attachments. How you can free yourself, and how you can discover the wonder and supremacy of the mind. The mind is the forerunner of all things. It's the most powerful of all things. You create your own suffering. You can create your own liberation. So it's all up to you. So it's all up to you. So it's all up to you. So it's.